I've been uh, studying martial arts for 42 years. Um, I identify first as a martial artist and secondary as a self-defense instructor. Um, what I teach is mostly awareness training. It's about being able to recognize something before it happens to you, right? And that comes with a few really good questions, like what is self-defense? You know, so what would you think self-defense is? If I was to say, what is self-defense to you? What, what is it? Protecting yourself. Protecting yourself, okay. Anything Make else? Make sure nobody hurts me. Make sure nobody hurts you, okay. Um, self-defense is actually defined as um, protecting oneself from self-harm or a loved one. You're allowed to protect a loved one in Canada. In our, in our laws, it says right in there, you can, protecting oneself or a loved one from harm. Right? And that's a pretty important uh, distinction because not a lot of countries have that in their laws. So I think that's one thing that's really cool. Self-defense for me is one thing, and that means I'm going to get home safe and intact the same way I left it. Right? So when we're talking about your, your personal awareness and your ability to um, have security for yourself and make sure that you're safe, there's quite a few different things that uh, we do regularly, which, um, how can I say it? You're either thinking in the future or you're thinking in the past. So when you were walking here tonight, you were thinking either, oh, I wonder what this self-defense course is gonna be like, or you were thinking, man, I just left work and I got this and I forgot that. But none of you are really in the moment and looking around you and seeing what's happening. And it's really, really important because we, we all do it. And you know, I don't know how many times you hear a parent come home on TV and stuff and they're like, wow, that drive from work seemed like it was really fast, right? And they even talk about it on TV, but that's what's happening. You're thinking about something else. You're not really paying attention to what's happening around you. We're all on autopilot. And um, that's what predators look for, right? They're looking for people that are showing meek behavior, um, not paying attention to their surroundings. Um, in the case of robberies and things like that, that's what we call antisocial violence. And antisocial violence is way worse than its counterpart, social violence, because you're guaranteed you're in physical harm with an antisocial violence situation. Bullying is, is considered antisocial as well, but sometimes words and things, you can work your way around it if we, if we get the proper training and things like that to make sure that we can talk and talk about these things. But once it gets physical, there's nothing that you can do to answer violence without using violence. You have to answer that to get out of that situation. And it's pretty scary. Um, Social violence is different, and that's what we all deal with mostly every day. Um, that's two egos, and they collide somewhere in the middle. Two people having a bad day, and something snaps. I don't get up in the morning and say, if anybody knocks the jays today, I'm going to kill them. Right? I, don't, I don't say those things. But you hear about people arguing about sports teams, and somebody punches somebody, and one falls down and cracks his head off the ground all the time. I didn't mean to do it. Those are the ones you see on TV all the time. I die. what? You know, I can't believe this. So social violence, um, we can avoid it by just being nice. It's pretty simple, right? If somebody's um, pressuring you or saying things to you, words don't hurt you. Only a physical action can hurt you. And when you process those words and you turn it to an emotion, that hurts. So when, somebody's, when you know somebody's being aggressive or towards you or uh, being socially violent, my thing is I just ignore the words. Yeah, whatever, I'm not talking to you right now. It's that simple, right? If you escalate or if you talk back, words become physical. Eventually there's a push, a shove, something happens. I, uh, I tell a story with the kids all the time because this happened in a high school in Quebec. And, um, the kids all broke into the school after school and they had a big bonfire in the middle of the football field. And it's like mid-February. Um, so it's about minus 20 outside. They had a huge fire. 
and two kids are talking, and one's cat calling the other one's girlfriend, and the other one's like, oh, F off, just gives them a little shove. Well, the kid tripped over the bag and landed in the fire. And it was such a big fire that nobody really realized the heat, because over here, at minus 20, no problem. You step in over here, you're at 380 degrees or something. You know, it was really, really hot, and nobody could get to the kid. So there's about 150 kids at that school that watched this kid burn to death, right? Yeah. And the other 16-year-old that pushed the 17-year-old or whatever, you know, he's been a mess, I guess, ever since, I'm sure, right? He didn't mean to kill that kid. And nobody, they all knew it was innocent, just a little shove. And even one of those is, is too much, right? We can't have those in our society, in our working society these days. It's not allowed, it shouldn't be there because you can never tell what's going to happen, right? And it's really important that we have those things down. Um, so social violence uh, happens if we're nice and we work on our verbal sparring, it's easy to get around. If you debate, it's better for you, right? Uh, Anti-social violence, you don't have a choice. So when I'm talking about anti-social violence, you're targeted for a reason, right? Um, if we take it from assaults and into uh, sexual assaults and rapes and things like that, there's uh, some pretty scary stats up there. 22% of women in Canada will be sexually assaulted in their lifetime. That's roughly one in five, right? If you haven't already, and it's varying degrees. It doesn't mean that you're absolutely going to be raped, but it could be somebody groping could be somebody uh, pressuring, somebody grabbing, all, anything along those lines that are included in those stats. So how do we keep away from these types of things? Um, one of the other stats that they talk about when it comes to the sexual violence is that 90% of the time, the woman knows the perpetrator. Over 90% of the time, they say that you know who the person is. Could be the electrician that worked in the house three weeks ago could be the guy that cleaned the pool in the summer. Um, you know, it could be the guy that's shoveling the driveway for you this winter. So whoever it is, there's some degree that they know you. And they always say that that makes it even worse for, for the people that I've talked to about um, being raped and things like that. They say that makes it worse because you feel doubly violated because this person's all of a sudden turning on you. Right? And that's pretty scary stuff when you think about it. So, what does an attacker want from you? What do you think he wants? Money, your life, your body, right? Your phone, your purse, all of the, the items that can give him something, let's say. That's when we're talking about an assault. If you're talking about a rapist, he's looking for your body. Right? And that's pretty scary situations to, to deal with. When we're outside here, you know, even just coming here today, I could see three or four homeless people walking along. Those people are vulnerable as well, but they're often off kilter. So you have to watch out for them, right? Um, an attacker is gonna want your valuables. He's gonna want your life or your body. So how do we stop an attacker? What do we have to do? <laughs> well, we can start by making it hard for him, right? So if I'm walking down the street, I don't want to be like, if this is the wall of the building and there's doorways and stuff, I don't want to be walking right beside the wall because I can't see if there's anybody right here. You know, I want to make sure that when I'm on the sidewalk, I'm out about three or four feet from the buildings so I can go here. And it's just a safety factor anyways. Any doors swinging out, you're going to miss them for sure. Right? And it just makes sense. But as I'm walking along now, that alcove that's there, I've got at least three or four feet to give me a warning if there is somebody there. And they hey, there's somebody there, right? Um, my daughter is 12 years old and, oh, sorry, she just turned 13. I keep forgetting. <laughs> <laughs> November 18th, she turned 13. Um, when I watch her walk down the street, I'm really proud because we played these games since she was about five. And what they are is, 
they're games to trick you to stay in the present moment. So I'm not thinking about the future and I'm not thinking about the past. And they're really simple, right? And one of them we, is we call it given a name. So as I'm walking around, I'm just listening for the normal decibel of noise. Anything below or above that decibel of noise, I'm gonna turn and look at it. So I'll be walking, that's a dog barking, that's a dump truck, that's a police car, that's somebody running. What's going on? And you, it helps you to pay attention. What it also does is for somebody that's casing you or looking at you or all of a sudden they're thinking about you as a target, it says to them, this person's erect, they're walking around, they're looking, their head's swiveling, they're not crouched over, they don't have earbuds in, they're not on their phone. You know, all the things that he wants you to be are not there. They're not present, right, by playing a game. And it's really simple. But when you watch my daughter and her like five friends that she grew up with walk down the street, they're like little Terminators. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, and it looks like that. And it's kind of neat to watch the whole posse of them walk, right? They've uh, grown up together that way, so it's pretty cool. The second game that I have her play is acknowledge everything coming towards you. Right? So as she's walking down the street, she's not like this. She's looking up. She's looking at people as she walks by. Just a little glance in the eyes. You don't have to say hi or anything. For a, a person that's going to attack you, or somebody that's going to uh, think about accosting you, that little act, that little gesture says, uh-oh, they recognize me. And it's almost at a subconscious level. So just by acknowledging everything in front of me, my brain's ticking off. Oh yeah, this, 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 this crumbled sidewalk, oh, guy on the bench, da da da, da. And I, I've got it all in my head as I'm going along so I can adjust where I'm walking. And I watched Genevieve do this uh, just about a month and a half ago. We're walking from my street and there's a no frills there. And there was a homeless guy on the bench. And Genevieve's walking along and uh, she sees him stir and he kind of stumbled out of his, his seat. And Jennifer just kind of went this way and he said, hey dear, hey, hey, you got the time? And she didn't miss a beat. She just kept on walking. He said, no, I don't. Right? And she just kept on going and kept her distance. And that's perfect self-defense. Right? That's perfect because you didn't have to act. You didn't have to do anything. You recognized something and you moved past it. Right? You avoided it and moved past it. Um, one of my karate instructors, uh, Rick Levier, he's an eighth degree black belt and he's responsible for most of Northern Ontario's karate development. Um, his saying was, the best defenses don't be there. Right? So that's a key factor. Now, um, targeted, somebody targeting you, let's talk about how do you know somebody's following you? How can you tell? How many of you had the feeling somebody's following you before? A few, and I'm sure. There's always a few in every group. Um, if, if a person's following you, they're gonna maintain the distance. So if you speed up, they're gonna speed up and maintain that same distance. Uh, if you slow down, they'll slow down. Right? If you abruptly cross the street, they might just trace you on the side, whatever the case is. But how, you have to have that gut feeling about how do I know if they're following me or not? Well, I can speed up, I can slow down, I can cross the street, I might go into a store for a couple of minutes and see if they're still out there when I go outside. Um, lots of people say take three right hand turns. Well, I don't recommend that, especially in the city, because you might end up in some back space with nowhere to go, and you turn around and there he is, right? Um, when, I'm, when I'm talking about somebody following me, I want to make sure that that's not the case, or I get somewhere safe as quick as possible, right? If somebody's casing me. So if I go into a store or something like that, and he's still there, I might ask for help, I might, um, call somebody or do something else about it, call the police if I have to, if I feel it's that bad, right? But I need to know that person's following me. And one of the things that um, a 13-year-old girl taught me last year, and she lived in Kitchener, Ontario, and I taught at the high school there. And she was, felt like she was being followed and everything, so she crossed the street, he crossed the street. 
She sped up, he sped up. She slowed down, he slowed down. She crossed the street again, and as soon as she got by a big restaurant, she turned around, because the patio was there, and she turned around and said, are you following me? And she watched the guy go. Mm -hmm. And off he went, right? Now, if somebody was following you, and you get to a space where you feel relatively safe with the general public around, and you turn and you ask them, if I wasn't following you, you're going to get a, what? No. You're not going to get a reaction like that, right? So I, I don't recommend it, but this girl did it in, in general public after talking to us about the course and stuff, and she had this happen. So she did it just because she knew she was safe by a restaurant, right? But I had another girl in Wolf area, and she tried to do the same thing, but she went up to a rural house with the lights on, and she knocked on the door and said, I, I, I don't have my cell phone. There's a car following me, and these guys are kind of accosting me. It's the third time around, can I please use your phone? And there was this little 90-year-old lady there, and she said no. And she closed the door off, <laughs> right? And so the little girl, she's like, oh, Darren told me to go to the first place I could, and you know, like, try to get some help. Now what do I do? And she's standing outside this lady's house, and she watches the car come around the corner again. And she said it just terrified her. She grabbed the planter and shot it right through her picture window. Smashed the window, smashed the old lady. Went like, oh, Are you crazy? I'm calling the police. And she's like, Good, thanks. I asked you to do that already, right? And that's how she got help. And she didn't get in any trouble. And the police picked up those two guys, not even a half an hour later, physically pulling a girl inside their car, right? It's pretty scary stuff when you're looking at these places that are relatively close to borders when you get Guelph, London you get into Sarnia and you're, you're getting close to the borders, it's really easy also for um, a subject that most people don't even know happens every day, and that's human trafficking, right? And it's crazy how it happens. It's unbelievable. Some of the uh, high schools that I've taught in here, I've taught the grade nine girls, and they're way too mature. And I asked the teacher what's going on. These girls, there's 23 girls out of 27 in the class that were all um, sexually trafficked from 11 till about 14, 15 before they busted all those gangs. And that was a while back. But these girls are all in school now. And they're all trying to get an education and stuff. And it's crazy when you hear about how prevalent it is and how easy it is for, for these things to happen. Um, so it's important when we're uh, thinking about ourselves going from one place to another, we're staying in the moment. It's also important to know that these things exist and they're out there and there's possibilities. Right? When I'm walking down the street, I take note of vans with no panels in them. I know those things because that's part of my life. Part of my background is uh, 26 years in the security industry. And I did some bodyguard work, bodyguard training. I did uh, I, I executive work for about 16 years running a security company and 220 employees. And the stories that we got to hear were outrageous because common sense would dictate that we can get out of these situations if we just recognize them, right? And that's the worst part about things. So, um, Let's talk about stairwells and elevators. We go into a building. You, it's not yours. You're visiting somebody. Elevator door opens. You see a person standing there. Do I get in? Do I not get in? Maybe he's got a great big hoop earring and a tattoo down his side. Does that make him a bad guy? Do I get in the elevator? How much, how much do we get that, that feeling? You know, what's safe, what's safe to get into? in a situation like that. If I'm going in the stairwell and I'm going down into the Rogers Center, you know, uh, the lights busted out two floors down. Do I want to go down there? And we have these intuitive gut feelings saying, don't do that. And most of the time we ignore it and do it anyways, right? Oh, that guy looks me. I'm going to get in there anyways. I don't want to wait 30 seconds, right? And that happens all the time where you know, that guy in the elevator, if you just went, no, it's okay, I'm, I'm waiting for a friend, whatever, let them go, take the next one, right? If you get that feeling that something's off, listen to it. It's intuition is 
such a great gift and most human beings don't listen to it because we, we reason differently and we can say, nah, I'm going to ignore that. Animals don't. Like if, I grew up in northern Ontario and when you're walking through the bush, everything's hunky-dory until it goes hush. But it goes hush for a quarter mile. There's not a squirrel or a chipmunk or anything moving around. And you know there's a predator in the area. And that's their instinctive reactions, right? Their intuition is right there for them, even though they're half a mile away from whatever that thing is. We don't listen to that anymore. And that's one of my firm beliefs is that we need to tap into that. Um, we have an instructor named Ron Anram with Safe International, another company I work with. And he was in uh, Israel and teaching this course to some guys there. And uh, he was on the bus going back. So he had his great big sack. And I've got all our pads and stuff in there. And as he was on the bus coming back, he just got a feeling, get off the bus. And he pulled the thing and he got off the bus and he walked the like 12 blocks back to the hotel. And then he turned on the news and bus number 38 on Tel Aviv Ave has blown up and 38 people dead. That was the bus he was on, right? And when we do our, our Skype things and we talk about these things, and he says, you know, I, I listened to my intuition, I got off and I can't believe it. And Richard, one of our other instructors, was like, I'm so glad none of us were with you, man, because, you know, it wouldn't have been the same. And he's like, why? And he said, if you would have told me to get off the bus with 12 blocks to walk, I would have said, forget it. You know, I'm not getting off. Stay here. And you probably would have stayed and we'd both be dead. Right? Like, it's little things like that that, how can you prove it? I can't prove intuition works. I just know when I have a gut feeling about somebody, I'm usually pretty right. You know, and you are too. So in that sense, we can't put clout in people's titles. And I don't care if you're a lawyer or a doctor or a politician or, you know, a superior court judge. Who are you as a person? That's what matters to me. Because that's how I'm going to be able to, to uh, counter any bad things coming at me. I need to judge people for people, not their titles. Right? And we all do it. It's kind of like part of our cultural society. Like, Oh, he's a Superior Court judge. Oh, that's wonderful. It's funny that Superior Court judge just got charged with pedophilia and human trafficking, right? These things happen quite a bit, and it's usually powerful people that are perpetrating these types of crimes. You know, our kids can go missing. And that's a scary thing for me with a 13-year-old, right? Now, what can we do about it? Well, there's... Awareness, we can be aware of what's happening. We can um, try to stay in the present moment by playing those games, right? And if worse comes to worse and now it's gonna go down, you have no choice, there's a situation coming, even those have pre-contact pre cues, right? Somebody has to approach you in order to assault you or to get near you. So I have to look for the things that that person does. Or what, what do they say? What are the common things? Well, some of the things we know are very common is that, hey, can you tell me what time it is? Do you know what time it is? That's very common. Same as, uh, hey, can you tell me where the pizza pizza is? Hey, I was looking for this doctor's office. I don't know, do you know uh, if there's a doctor's place down here somewhere? You know, the obscure questions like that. And you're like, oh yeah, pizza pizza's over there, bang. And then you take, they take your stuff, right? Or whatever the case might be. It could be one of those situations. That's how uh, people will try to approach you. So when I'm telling the time, somebody asks me what time it is, Genevieve has a great method. She just says, no, I don't know, and she keeps moving because she doesn't interact with people if she's not sure, right? If you're gonna show somebody what time it is with your phone or whatever, don't look down at your phone. Hold it up and keep the subject there. That person is a subject until they attack you, and we have to be that way. We have to be morally and ethically responsible. I can't just like, oh, I thought he was gonna pop off, so I poked his eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't do that. Does, it, does that kind of make sense? Obviously. Mm -hmm. So, when I'm, uh, uh, where was I? I was just talking about, yes. So, if he's gonna approach you and he's gonna get anywhere near you, you need to, um, Number one, keep your space. So you don't want to let them within this distance of you, three feet, right? That's pretty common. So um, do you guys want to just 
get into the physical portion? Are you ready? Yeah, sure. do it. All right, get up. Here's <laughs> <laughs> your volunteer guard. Yeah, a lady in blue. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to pull these pads out. We'll grab, we'll get to them in a second. I'll try to get the best ones so that you guys don't mash up your hands. How many do we have? Two, four, six, eight, ten. Good. Okay. So we only need about five of those. All right. So whenever somebody's going to approach you and they're going to uh, come to you, to talk to you, get, anytime they're approaching, you need to maintain your distance and your space. You also want to watch where their hands and arms are. If they've got a hand in a pocket or something, you want to start moving. You don't want to be anywhere where you can't see what they're deploying. Maybe they're not deploying anything. He might just have his hand in his pocket, right? But you need to make sure that you're not going to end up with somebody walking up to you and slowly pulling out a knife and putting it to your throat. Because that's how they are. They know how humans react. So they're very, very cool and cautious. And, hey, how you doing? Right? And then you're like, what the hell is going on? And these types of things happen with, with uh, robberies. Now, so when somebody's approaching me, they're going to have to talk to me. They're going to do something. They're not, never do they just walk up silent. They never just like walk up to you and do something. When, when it's gonna happen, they're gonna have to try to approach you some, hey, are you Susie's, you're Susie's sister, right? I know, I, we met, right? And this distance is okay. It's when they start pressing that distance that you need to start acting, right? First thing I wanna do is I, I wanna get my hands up. I never want my hands down when somebody uh, subjects in front of me. If my hands are down here, hands are quicker than the eye, you'll be able to hit me before I can get them up from my head. So I always put my hands up like this, and when I teach uh, law enforcement or bouncing, anybody working with the public and they're dealing with a volatile individual or they think they might be, we do the interview stance is what it's called for police work. I call it just the passive stance. My hands are up, and I, I'll talk to you like this, like this, you know, I always have my hands right here, and the minute you start to approach, I just, hey, I just get my hands out this way. I never want to stand with my feet underneath my shoulders, because if I do get hit or there's any force coming in, my legs are going to kick out. So I'm not going to be able to do anything with that. I like to stand just off to the side so that I make a smaller target for my, I'm not saying I'm fat or anything, but, <laughs> you know, just a smaller target. Um, and I keep my hands up this way, so that if anything does happen, I have a nice flinch response, right? Whenever you hear like a loud bang or something, and usually it, uh, when the percussion comes from behind you, almost every human being in the world goes, and they do this. It's because your brain's smarter than you are, and you have an instinctive reaction, so why aren't we using them? You know, we're talking to people, our hands are down, things are happening, there's a possibility something could go off, I just want to be ready, right? It doesn't mean that I'm, I'm always pessimistic or thinking about this. I'm just always ready. This is my normal, right? I never cross my arms like this because now you can press them in and there's nothing I can do about it, right? I'm always, I'll always keep my hands out this way. If I do cross, I'm crossing like this. I never ever cross them right over and tuck them in because you get stuck, right? Somebody will push on that if they're attacking you, steal your phone or your purse, and off they're gone, right? At least it's just your valuables. If they want your valuables, get rid of them, let them go. Take your phone, toss it away, say go get it. Get yourself some distance. Take your purse, throw it that way. Never ever just hand it to them, right? Because you're still in danger then. I'd rather they go for what they're looking for than me. All right, I can replace all that stuff. So interview stances like this and put your hands up like them. So we just kind of want to be here and you're going to be talking and you know like a, a really good question in situations when somebody keeps approaching, that's your tell sign is I, I'm approaching and I'm not respecting any barriers. This is really close, right? So you, this is a warning sign. Either 
there's something wrong with this person here and he doesn't understand barriers, or that person's in my space to do something. Right? Th those are your only two options. So I need to maintain my distance. So if you approach me, and, I'm the, and now you're the person approaching, and I'm, I'm going to follow your lead. So you approach me and disrespect my barriers. Hey, how are you doing? What, what do, what, how can I help you? What do you think? <laughs> right? And all of a sudden, we break into a dance. <laughs> um, but I always want to make sure that I'm maintaining a distance, and I'm looking around me because my environment can be used to my benefit or it can be used to their benefit, right? So if there's a, uh, a broken fence right there and there's a loose board, I don't want to be anywhere near that with some guy approaching me, you know, because they think that way too. I've interviewed some of these guys. Um, one of them in particular is a bank robber and he shot a policeman in the face and he killed him. And I asked him if he had any remorse and the way that he explained it to me, he put it back to like a self-defense scenario for me, which was really neat, because he said, no. He said, in court I found out he had a wife and two daughters, and I'm really sorry about that. You know, I'm really sorry about that. But when I was doing my job, my job is to get the money and rob the bank and bring it back. That's what I was doing. And he pulled me over for a stupid, erratic right turn. Right? And he's like, so, if he wouldn't have pulled me over, he wouldn't have known I robbed the bank, he wouldn't have never caught me, but he pulled me over, so I had to shoot him in the face, because I gotta get the money where it's gotta go. That's my job. And then he said, let me put it to you this way. When you teach your courses and you say, what can you do with this? Right? And I said, okay, so he didn't put his hands on me, but he showed a choke, right? And he said, what can you do with this? And I said, well, there's lots of things you could do, but number one, both hands are on me, I just need to make sure my trachea is intact and I keep my carotid arteries open and you're not doing anything. You're not hurting me. Right? And he said, right, that's the way you think. So now what would you do to counter it? Well, I'm going to start shooting at your face because that's the very first concept of self-defense. And that's what we're going to get to right now. Is the very first concept is no matter what's happening, when somebody's attacking you, you put your hands in their face and their brain will take over and say, get off of me. Right? And they can't think past that because the brain's instinct is way too strong. I need these eyes. I need that information to be processed so I can move. I need that nose. I need that mouth because I need the oxygen. The brain's way smarter than any human's ability to, to do something. You know, so when, when a situation comes up and I'm thinking this, I'm going to go right to the eyes and I might go to the leg. I might trip on whatever the case might be. And he says, Right, and you know what I think about? I'm gonna squeeze the Adam's apple in. I'm gonna pull in tight. I'm gonna make sure to block my legs so you can't hit me in the groin. That's, that's the way we think. You know, and it's, it's, it totally threw me. It was such a learning curve, right? To go, oh, right, it's the other side. But we don't think they actually plan these things out. But they do, right? They're good at it. Where, how many of you have ever been in a real physical fight in your life? Any? As a kid. As a kid? That's fair. Any, any tactical uh, combat is still combat, right? <coughs> These guys, every time they attack somebody, it's real. They learn leaps and bounds faster than the rest of us. Because they have to. They can't get caught, right? There's three things that any attacker doesn't want. They don't want attention drawn to the situation. So screaming, yelling, uh, causing a ruckus. They don't want to get caught, obviously, and they don't want to get hurt, right? We have laws and we have confines of society based on those laws. They live outside those, but they still have to blend in. So if you put a scratch mark on their face or you know, you get a scratch mark across their arm or you punch them hard enough that they have a bruise, they have to answer for that. They still have to say what happens to them when, when they go meet up with their mom or their friend, right? So anytime we fight back and we hurt them, that's one of the athemias to, to an attacker. He definitely doesn't want that to happen. So if we scream and yell and we fight back when we know we're being attacked, when somebody attacks us, that's 
70% of the time they say uh, they'll run away or they'll leave, they'll disengage, 70% of the time. Today, this last hour, is about the other 30% of the time, when he's not going to run away. And that's, that's where we want to get to. So, if we're here in a nice, easy stance, let's just, how about we take a two minute break? My mouth is so pasty, I don't know why it's going so dry. I need a drink. If you guys want to get anything, the kitchen's there. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Craig, did you drive in from uh, the picnic? Go for it. Oh, okay. yeah, almost picnic. Almost picnic. Almost picnic. Oh, yeah, yes. that was terrible. Okay. 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 And I mean, nobody got anything except for me getting a drink, right? Okay, so let's go from here. So we're standing ready, person's coming towards us. When they're going to physically attack you, you're going to see a few things happen. Number one, um, your body is an organism and it needs to ramp up for a physical event. So you're going to see those telltale signs in his body. You will see his fingers twitching, you will see him uh, kind of pacing maybe, because as he's going to do this, his brain's saying, I need more oxygen, and he starts to breathe in more oxygen, and he starts breathing a little heavier. And then you get twitchy because you got too much oxygen in your body. That's a natural reaction. For us, it'll be similar, but not quite the same as him. When he's doing that, you're gonna see he's agitated. That's gonna throw you, or tell you, okay, I need to watch out for this individual. Doesn't mean I have to do anything, I need to watch out for him. You see it on the subway platforms every other day. This guy, you know, and talking to himself sometimes. Yes, it, he might have some mental issues and, um, you know, he might need some help. However, he's still dangerous to me. And I have to look at it that way. I need to watch and take care of myself, right? Now, if they're going to um, physically attack you or come towards you from the front, there's a few things that are really cool about self-defense that differentiate from martial arts or fighting. Um, one of them is that we move in circles. So it doesn't matter if I'm pushing at you, if I'm punching at you, if I'm hitting at you, I can throw straight punches. And some of the street guys are doing it now. They're not very good at it yet, but they're learning, right? But these, this is a natural reaction. And when they're gonna come at you, everything has to come to the center line. So if I'm pushing, my hands are going straight in the center. If I'm hitting, it goes to the center. If I'm coming underneath to grab, I'm still coming to your center here. Everything that comes at you from the front has to go to the center line because of the way the skeletal structure works, right? Really good tactical people. There's not much you're going to do with an hour of self-defense against them anyways. However, if they're coming in at you and you get something like that, you know, hey, can you tell me where the pizza pizza is? Ah! And they're on top of you. That's pretty scary. So when that happens, I want you to think of no matter where that comes at your body, your hands shoot up straight this way. Because I'm cutting off every angle coming at my body here. The other thing I want to do is I don't want to go backwards. If I'm doing this, we call this an apologetic shove. I want to shoot in. And I want my hands to run on his face. So my hands are gonna hit it like so, boom. So we're here, a person comes in, whatever they're gonna do, punch, whatever. I'm gonna shift in this way. My shoulders protect my jawline. And once I'm inside, my front leg, my front hand, like a pie in the face. I want this to hit the face this way, okay? Because as soon as I start touching this, his brain's gonna start firing and his hands are gonna come up and he's not gonna be thinking about that attack for that tenth of a second. He's gonna be thinking, oh, shish kebab, I'm in trouble, right? That's what's gonna happen. And that's the kind of interruption that we need so that we can gain the advantage to get away. It still has to be ethically and morally responsible. So if I go bang, 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 bang boom, <laughs> that's assault, right? I, I need to disengage from the situation and get away as quickly as I can. So I'm going to start here and I'm going to go one into the face, two, three. Always maintaining my shoulders here. 
Because when you actually hit somebody really hard and fast in the head, most people don't see this because it's not in the movies, but when you, when you really jam the face, the arms flail, and they'll do that. And I'm 227 pounds, and one of these coming upside your head, that, that'll turn you sideways, right? So you really want to make sure that your hands are up and protecting your jawline when you're hitting that face. I, I don't want to hit like this and drop my hands. Does that make sense? Yeah. We don't want to slap. You want it to come straight in, so we're going up and in. If I start hitting like this, you're going to do this. And all that's going to do is really piss somebody off, right? <laughs> so you, you want to go straight in, and you're trying to rock the head. Get it to move backwards from you, okay? I, I, it's funny, I know. I, you should see the great sevens when I teach them. Like, ah. <laughs> okay, so um, one pad for every two people. So one, two. How many left? Five, 13 here. So that's five, that's 10. Now I got some more. just going to use this for demonstration to show you guys safety first. This is the head of your attacker. That's what we're going to use today. Um, sometimes I bring a head mask and I let you guys bat me around a bit, but I was fighting last night for about an hour and 45 minutes with my guys done. A little rung today, so. Um, this here is going to act like the head. Number one, I want to put my hand on the wrist here so that I reinforce my wrist. Because people hitting this, and when you're not used to hitting, you'll just hit it sideways. You'll snap the wrist back this way. So hold it like this, so you make sure that you don't hurt your wrist when they're hitting this part. The second thing is don't hold it in front of your face, because you're going to get hit. <laughs> if we get to the groin strikes and uh, a quick back attack at the end, if we have enough time and you guys are really astute, um, don't hold it in front of your groin, because you're going to get hit. Hold it over here, right? So, the attacker's gonna hold this up, like so, and you're gonna approach the person, and I want you to kind of be sly, say, some, hey, hey, how you doing, whatever. Find a way to approach that person, and once you get within range of them, boom, I want you to shoot out. Take your partner and make sure they can hold this a little bit above their head, because your attacker is never gonna be smaller than you. It's, he's already chosen you, if that's the case, if this is coming up, or even a robbery, somebody's coming up to rob you of a belty one, they chose you. They chose you because they know you're going to be easy, you're going to be fast, right? So when you come in with this, I want you to really shoot at the person so that they can um, pick up on a natural reactions, right? If I'm going to shoot in at you, besides me doing all of this, usually, and I say usually because I see it so much in the videos. When they're ready to attack, they will do a quick three and nine check. One of these. Subconsciously looking for witnesses. I'm not sure what it is, but it's really common in all the real attacks that we watch. And they'll do that and boom, right? As they attack, you're gonna see the shoulders flex. You're gonna see the pectoral muscles come out. And all of this has to happen for them to move in on either side or together, right? So while I'm looking at you and I'm approach, I'm here, as soon as I see this, I know he's coming, right? Do I have time to get away? I have a split tenth of a second to figure that out, right? So if I go in, if I can't get away and I have to go in, I'm going in a thousand percent, as if I'm fighting a Terminator, right? So I want to go from here, when that person comes in with the pad, because you have to act the part out. Boom, shift in. When they do that, that's when you're going to bust in. One, two. And I just want you to start with that and get a feel for the pads. Leave your fingers loose and hit with this part. So it's like this. 
I want my fingers loose because just by anatomy alone, they land right in the eyes. And that's perfect. It's really good. All right? Okay. So let's just start off. Can I have one person come here with me for a second? So I'm going to hold this up, and you're going to be, you're at a bus stop. Okay? Hey, how you doing? Aren't you Jeremy's sister? No. Hey, you sure? You look really cute. Yeah. So there is where you were going to go. One, two, three. And I want you to hit this so that when you hit it the first time, I want this to hop. Okay? And that hurt when I just did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm going to shoot in. So now I'm just going to take away all that talking part, right? That's the part where fear kicks in. And fear is an excellent indicator that something's wrong. And that's all it is. It, it shouldn't cripple you. It shouldn't... Uh, hinder you at all. Fear is a really good friend because it says you need to act right now. As soon as you feel fear, whatever it is, oh my gosh, my project. I know I should have done my project. I need to finish my project now. And that fear goes away. This guy's approaching me. He's waking me out. Okay. I need to act. I need to do something. The, the problem is we always try to be too nice to somebody approaching. And there's nothing wrong with getting your hands up and showing, like, get the hell away from me, right? At that point, he's either going to attack or he's going to go away. So you, you're at your crucial moment. You couldn't get away. He's approached. He's here. And when he shoots in, so put your hands up here. So you want to be this way. And not necessarily like, hey, you know. I'm just like, hey, how can I help you? What do you need? Right? My hands are neutral. I don't want to be like... Uh, I'm scared or anything. I don't want it. I just want to be normal, right? I just want to be here and how can I help you? What do you need? And have my hands up so that if he does attack, I can shoot, right? So I'm going to shoot at you and you're going to go, boom. okay? So I come in, boom, two, three. So did you see when she first hit it, how our body's here backwards? A real attack would be coming pretty hard. So you need to move in. Get the weight on the front leg. Okay? So grab your partners. Give that a try. In one, two. It's always tough to get started. <laughs> Good one. Good one. Good one. Good one. Sorry, what's your name? Craig. Craig. You want me to do that for you? Or do you want me to do that? Well, we still need to get When you train martial arts and stuff, they teach you how to hit with these two knuckles, and it lines up with this bone. 
right? So when I hit here, the impact goes through my arm, my muscles absorb it, goes down my spine and open my legs. So what my legs, when I'm hitting, really drive that punch, right? We're using the open palm for the same reason I talked about with your brain having instinctual reactions, get off my face, right? And what we're gonna do is, we use the open palm because it covers more area, and it's more information for the brain. And it hurts a little bit more. And then I don't break my hand either, right? So all of the good things about hitting with the open palm are, are there. And this is counterproductive. Unless you train, right? If you know how to hit, it's a different story. But if, you, if you've never hit anything, this is the best strike you have. You know, it, our hands are made perfectly. They're wonderful weapons. So, um, now that we've started doing this, what I'd like for you to do is all the people with the pads line up here, and everybody that doesn't have a pad line up on this side, and I want you to try to accurately hit the middle of the pad as you go down the floor. So the people holding this pad, you're going to shoot in like an attack, and then as they start hitting back, once I hit and I shift, I want you to start shifting back. And go backwards with them, okay? So this is, we're talking about the first half a second of an encounter, where the guy goes, wah, and you just went, wah, wah, wah. That's all we're doing, and we're going to do it over and over until we get a little bit of accuracy. So it's just a little drill I like to do. Once you get to the other wall, uh, watch that tripod. Everybody move over. <laughs> yeah. Once you get to the other wall, just switch the pad to the other person and attack them and bring it right back, okay? So attackers are moving to you. Don't move to the attackers, because if, if she's over there, I'm like, oh, yeah. I'll be on CP24. Does that make sense? Okay, so let the attacker come to you. Make sure that you guys are in your stances. Look here. I want to make sure I'm in an interview stance. My hands are up. And as they approach, they're going to attack. So give them a go all the way to this wall. On your own. <laughs> Good. They don't want noise, so I'm going to be screaming. <laughs> Switch the pads around and then the other side goes back. Okay, so it's kind of sweaty. Try to um, make sure that people know what's happening to you. As, as you go through this, you know, it shouldn't just be like, ah, I'm hitting something. You need to like, back up the way! Right? <laughs> like, really be loud and try it because it gives you more power in your hits too. Oh. You scared the poor lady. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go ahead. So when I'm watching you guys go through this, again, remember, we're in the first half a second of uh, us saving our own lives, right? Um, one thing is don't reach, right? I never, if his head's that far away, I don't want to try to reach for it like this. My legs have to stay underneath me, and the good rule is to keep your head over top of your hips. So when I shift in, both of my legs come with me, right? When I strike out, that's as wide as I'm going. If I'm any wider, it's easy for them to trip me or for me to trip myself, okay? So we got into the physical aspect of what's going on. Let me tell you what's going on in your brain right now. So scientifically speaking, all the blood drains from your cerebral cortex when you go under adrenal stress. So anytime you've been slapped in the face and you get that chill, <laughs> go through your body, that's adrenal stress. You lose your fine motor skills, right? So if somebody walked in that door, put two shots in the ceiling and said, I'm gonna kill you all, and we had to run out that door and punch in a four digit code, none of us could do it. We'd be like, oh, like that. And 
because all the blood drains from here, and that's the logical part of your brain. So that's where you go, two times two is four, four times four is 16, two times three is six. All of those things rest here. And that's what happens in martial artists too. Because they go, I have it happen at least once a year. I've got almost a thousand students in Southeastern Ontario. And every year I have one of the 16, 17, 18, even 23 year olds come in. Since I, listen, I had an altercation last night and this sucks like the guy just beat the crap out of me. And like, I've been training with him for six years. What did I do? Well, you worked under adrenal stress. You've been training in this nice, safe gym here for the last six years. And when that happens, you go, oh, oh, stop. And you know you're safe. That guy hit you and you weren't safe. Blood drained out of your head. All the tools you know went away. All right, so um, it grab my wrist. In martial arts, we'll show you to get the baby finger up to the ceiling. And I can usually release a grip. All right, if you grab with the other hand, I'd say same thing. I want the baby finger up to the ceiling. It's the thumb and the baby finger that make it grip. Right? So she's got a nice monkey grip going on there. <laughs> you did a little training, eh? <laughs> yeah. So that's awesome. Um, this way, <coughs> her thumb's not holding on at all, so I just need to pop out. Right? But if she's got a really good grip on me and I want to get out, I'm going to have to break the structure of the arm. Under adrenal stress, you don't have time to, you can't think of one, two, three, four, pull around, break. You can't think like that, right? You're, you're wigged out and you're going, Aah! that's what's happening to you. So all we have are gross motor skills. Hands in the face, hit hard, hit hard. I don't have any fine motor stuff to start playing Muhammad Ali, right? It doesn't work. And the same thing when I'm hitting that pad or that person's face, I don't want to switch my stance. Whatever way I end up is the way I want to stay. Because if I start going like this, I'm going to trip over my own feet. Guaranteed. I've watched professional fighters do it all the time. All right? So you want to keep here. When I hit, 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 my feet are this way. One, two. One, two. And my shoulder's always protecting my jawline. Okay? So now, once we start hitting that guy's head, he's not going to let us hit him across the room like this. He's going to turtle. Okay, natural instinctive reaction, that's what happens. So once you hit, his head's gonna turtle. Attackers, make sure when you're holding the pad, you turn it as high as your shoulder. And I see everybody does this all the time, and the guy's not gonna go, ah, ah, he won't do that for you. He's gonna be up here, you're gonna hit him, his head's gonna come down. So I want you to go one, two, three, and hold it right where his head is. And you're going to aim for this meaty part of the neck here. And you're going to give it a hammer fist this way. Okay? So the reason why we're doing that is this nerve center in your neck has about five clusters that sit like this. And when you hit it, they open and they start shaking. If you can get that to fully exposed, that's what we call a technical knockout. The person can't see anymore. Right? I'm still morally and ethically responsible enough to get the hell out of there. He can't see me for at least a tenth of a second, a twentieth of a second. It gives me time to disengage and go. Does that kind of make sense? If I can. So, one, two, three, hit, hit, hit. Try that on the pad, and then we're going to um, go to wrist grabs and hair pulls. Okay, give it a shot. So, uh, those of you with the pads, turn around this way so you can just move. When they get it, just move with them. Right? Because that head's not going to stay there. You're not going to go like this. Right? He's not going to stand there for you. He's going to move. shoulder or your other shoulder okay. right and don't be shy to switch it up on them either because once you start hitting my face I'm gonna start bobbing and weaving right 
And so will your attack. With the side that you yep. The uh, hammer strikes all with the same hand or alternating hands? No, always use the same hand same. because you, you have what I call a datum. One hand on somebody um, means you don't have to look. Right. Right? So if I'm out here and I just want you to like weave the pad like that. So I can hit it, I can hit it, I can hit it, I can hit it. Pull the back. I missed it. Right? Because the head went backwards. I didn't see where it was. But the moment I do this, I don't have to look anymore. I know exactly where his entire body is. Because I have a tactical sense. All of us do. Right? So as soon as I touch something, I know where it is. I can hit it. I can hit it. Right? So I don't have to worry about it. And we always try to attach. Right? Um, I'll go this way. Like, I'll just touch it. This pow! Right? So I slap it, touch it, whatever I need to do to get my eyes on it. Boom, boom, boom. Right? And I'm screaming the whole time. If you get to this point, you're almost right beside his ear. And I have literally knocked people out just by going, ah! In their ear. <laughs> Drop. It's a really good tool. Sorry, I did it too much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, give it a shot. Go. that I talked about first? When somebody's going to attack you, it's the first thing that we want to think of. Escape. Hands in the face. Right? <laughs> so violence needs to be answered with violence initially to get you the hell out of there. Right? If they're going to assault you, you need to have a reason to be able to get through that. Right? So um, whenever something arises for me, my wife's face and my daughter's face comes to my mind, right? And I'm like, I gotta get home. That's all I can think about. So that gives me my purpose when I do this stuff. And my training partners are 380 pounds, and when I turn that on, they're really scared of me, right? Because that's, that's my whole reason. That's my everything. It gives me 10,000% who I am when I have to be. And you need to have that too, because if something does happen and you end up going through this ordeal and you're assaulted or you're raped or something happens to you, it's going to make something snap in your brain. And you're not going to look at life the same anymore. I have major PTSD from uh, all my work and the episodes and things that I've dealt with growing up in Northern Ontario. And when uh, something like this happens to you, it's kind of like you're living on top of a waterfall and you've been up there your whole life and you know where everything is and it's all great. And one day there's a torrential rainstorm and you slip and you fall off. Well now you're 180 feet below the waterfall and you don't know how to get back up. You know everything that was there, but everything's different now. Right? And that's what happens. It affects your, your past, the way you look at it. It affects your present, the way you act and it's always gonna affect your future. So if something does happen, it's so important to get help. Professional help, right? Even for the smallest issue, and I'm sure most of you guys, being volunteers and health workers, you already know that. You should, you should seek help if you need it, right? It's super important. Now, in my history in dealing with these things, I've been stabbed a few times, if you have a look at that, you know? Um, my ankles are just riddled with cut marks. Anytime I've, I've dealt with an edge weapon, it's never, ever went well. I always get cut. I've never not been cut when somebody's pulled a knife on me. Right? So 
And anytime I could, I would use this defense, absolutely. But sometimes I couldn't, right? And, and that's just the nature of, of doing security guard work and doing community patrols. That's what happens sometimes. You run into the wrong person. When, one time I scared a gentleman at 3390 Keel. He was shooting up in the stairwell and I scared him because I came around the corner and I startled him. And when I did that, he went like this with his needle. And I smacked him with my flashlight. I got charged with excessive use of force. I broke his wrist, right? And I had to go fight that in court. That took almost two years. But the tactical sense of what you're doing right now, you need to have the mindset of, not me, not today, I'm getting home. I'm getting past you and I'm getting out of here. Right, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so when we look at front attacks now, so anything that I'm gonna do, can I use you? I'm gonna get you to just use your hands, but don't hit me too hard, okay? Come here. <laughs> so put your hands here and keep them out just a little bit, all right? So you want your hands out, out, and just kind of natural like this. Hey, what are you doing, all right? See, oh. nice and natural, just hey, all right? So when I attack, I want you to do the exact same move every single time. All I want you to do is just shift. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just from here, shift. That's it, yeah, get that weight forward. Shift, right? Shift. <laughs> wow, shift, <laughs> keep it, that's okay. Shift, and shift, uh, and shift it. Uh, I'm gonna need that to. every single time, right? Now, if I'm going hard and fast, which I won't do, if I go woof, your hands are still blocking all of your off buttons here, right? So this is probably the safest position you could be in when anybody moves towards you. And once she's there, now she's got some datum. She's touching me. She knows where I am. This hand comes back, whack, whack, right? Yeah, or boom, 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 pull that leg, right? There's tons of things you can do to get out of the situation, but the number one rule is get your hands in the face. That's the concept. Because remember when I was talking about all the blood draining from your brain? Well, all that blood goes to your reptilian brain. And all that knows are concepts. Black is black, white is white, red is red, blue is blue, and get your hands in the face. It's a concept. And your brain can remember that. So it's super important, right? That when we shoot in, that's exactly what we're doing. No matter what happens, how panicked or scared I get, ah, whatever it is, I just, as soon as I remember that, get my hands in the face, it'll start to work. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, we could beat the dead horse. I could do that with you guys a little bit more, or we could go into some situational, uh, like, location grab. Somebody trying to drag you from one place to another. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, these things happen a lot more than you would think, right? Domestic situations, boyfriend, girlfriend situations, father, daughter situations, uh, mother, son situations. These pulls and, and um, secondary location grabs happen a lot. That's what we call them because it means I don't want to get you somewhere else. Right now, parents do it in a socially violent way sometimes. <laughs> get over here, you little bird, right? Like, I see it happen in the playgrounds quite a bit. It's still socially violent behavior, right? I'm not one to go tell another parent, hey, don't do that to your kid, but I would never do it to mine, you know? And, and I understand that those are the kinds of kids that are gonna grow up to pull their girlfriend and try to do those things because that's how they were raised, right? And it's important that if you do see it, if, you, if they're friends with somebody like that, try to talk to them about it. Right? We need to change the way that people do these things. All right, if I'm going to grab you and try to take you somewhere, can I use you? <coughs> sure. Yeah. So I might, um, I might try to grab the wrist. I might pull on both wrists. I might go cross arm. I might go same arm. Right. So when I'm looking at this, cross arm is actually same arm. Why? Okay. Yeah. And this is mirror image, right? So these are the only four ways somebody can grab you from the front or the back. So it's going to be the same, it's going to be cross, 
or it's going to be saved, or it's going to be crossed. So the only thing that makes it grab is the thumb and the baby finger. Right? So as soon as somebody tries to latch onto you, these three fingers can't grab. It's these two that put that structure together. Right? So it's important that we go against those two levers, because that's all they are. There's no strength in them. Right? So if I grab and I pull, you're going to think of, i got to get out of this. You got that hand free. Mine's over here. I'm pulling you in the face. <laughs> right? Now, if you go really wide like that, I'm going to see it. All right? So if I'm trying to pull her somewhere, let's say I'm going like this, my next step's going to be to smother you, right? I'm going to move, right? So you need to get that to go straight through. So pull on my wrist. Straight there. Right? So I want to go straight across the body here. Grab on the other side, yeah. Straight across here. I don't want him to see this. Okay, so it's gonna come straight. Yeah. Now, you, it was really funny about that is I could throw this at 65 miles an hour and put it off your eyebrow here, but I just touched your face, so I'm a little embarrassed with that. Okay. Okay. So um, when they come in, if they're going to grab, even if somebody's grabbing your clothes, right? And this happens to men a lot. Guys will grab on, like, yeah, you bastard, whatever, right? When that happens, I'm always in heaven. Like, that's great, because he's not hitting me with that. If he's got both hands on me, that's awesome. He's not hitting me at all. And then, boom, 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 that guy falls down real fast. But when he grabs your wrist and he's pulling, you're in danger. Because if you get to that secondary location, he knows that it's going to give him more of an advantage. You can make noise. He can do what he wants. He's not going to be interrupted, right? So he'll keep going. So when I grab your wrist and I pull, can I use your pad? Sure. I'm going to, I'm going to pull on you and I'm going to put this up. And I want you to, yeah, that's this. Okay. Don't see this one? <laughs> This one. Okay. okay? All right. Yeah. And scream. All right? So I'm going to just walk around you and I'm going to grab you however I want. And you line that up. Hey, come here. Good, good, good. So now you put it on. And here's the finish for this, okay? And this works all the time. Once you hit this, I don't want you to let it go. All right, so grab, pull. Once I hit it, I'm just going to start rapid fire hammering this. Just like that. If they still hold on to my arm, if they're too big, I'm not going to get out of any of these levers anyways. But if I do this, he's going to let go. All right? It works for five-year-olds. I teach anti-abduction this way. Somebody picks them up, grab the back of the head and smack, scream and yell, wrap your legs around, and you can't, you can't go anywhere. Because once they start doing this, even if I'm trying to take you somewhere else I can't see, my brain says, get off me. I, I will stop walking, literally. Right? So it's really important that we interrupt that. Because big, strong guys or somebody that's doing this, They've probably done it before, and they have some experience with it, right? So I want to interrupt that by keeping that hand in there. And if I feel really in danger, I'll start ripping and scratching, right? And that's important because you get DNA under your fingernails, and after an event like this, you always want it right away. You want to go clean up, but you should resist that and make sure that they do a, a kit on you because even if that person's never been caught before, he'll be in the national database, right? You're still doing society a favor. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so walk around, grab the wrist, pull, and the person with the pad, hold it up to the side, make sure it's not where I had mine, because I just about ate a couple of them, <laughs> right? Got it? Give it a try. Let's see how it works. <clears throat> Sorry to uh, scratch you. <laughs> <laughs>
That doesn't work with the guy here. You want to grab the other arm? Sure. Yeah. So, when the guy says, And you find yourself getting stuck like this. Do you want to push through on this side and then right back? Right? So this is very common. It's very common when you hit it. That's okay. When you hit it, you overshoot. If you overshoot, your elbow is right there and your hand can come back in a nice rake. And you really need to reset because if I'm here or you're here, you're coming wherever I want you to go pretty quick. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So you want to shoot back on that head. If you overshoot the glove, shoot back on it the same way, just as if you're hitting it again. Right? And I always think of, I want my hands in here. So whatever I do, pow, my hands are back here. Pow, my hands are back here. They're always right here, ready to go. No matter what I'm doing. They pull on my wrist, pow, it's right back here. I'm ready to go again. Right? I, if I always think about having my hands here, they're never going to be out here and exposed for him to grab onto. Because remember, he's going to be bigger. He's going to be stronger. He's probably going to be faster. And for sure, he's going to be meaner. Right? So you need to really answer to make that brain fire and say, holy crap, I'm getting out of here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, do this a couple more times, and then I want to go to... <coughs> Hair pulls, and I'm going to show you guys a couple of uh, what I like to call can openers. Can openers are really fun because you can do them on your friends and stuff. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and let me tell you, when you get a bunch of fifth, six dance together and we're doing can opener stuff, it's a really crappy evening for all of us. <laughs> all right? So um, I'll show you some of those because it's important when somebody's trying to control you or somebody is overpowering you how to get them to flinch and move and ah, get off me, right? And when they start doing that, it gives you that second to, to get out of that overbearing mode, I guess you could say, right? Does that make sense? So if I, I'll show you guys after. Do this. Let's do this. I love this stuff so much, I could go on for hours. Right? Hey! Yeah. All right. <laughs> So I do this and I hit the face. So I'm here, right? 
You notice how I have my one leg behind? This is very common. It's going to happen when he pulls. Your body moves in circles, right? So as he pulls and I'm going to strike, I don't want him to see this coming. So I shoot it straight across my body this way with his pull. And I'm going here. Now, here's in actuality where you are. So watch here. If he doesn't let go here, I'm going to grab and pull. Oh. <laughs> right? Now, this doesn't require strength. And the reason is, we're manipulating the whole skeletal structure. I'm not giving him anywhere to move from here, and his spine bends for me, and his neck bends. And if I hold this part, he's, look at how cockamamie that was, right? <laughs> and I do this to like 300 million pound guys all the time. When I'm fighting with my guys, sometimes if I overshoot and I get on their head, I just do that. And they almost fall over, right? So when, when you get inside, if you can, and you're looking at leverage, that's something to look at at uh, self-defense later on. If you, if you pursue this and learn more, you're gonna be learning about how the skeletal structure works, right? So uh, for instance, put your leg up. Yeah, just put your leg up. So you see where his knee is over top of his foot here? This is really hard to move. Now just, just two inches, not even, one inch back. Now watch, hold me. Just me. <laughs> really easy, really easy. Now the other thing is, if my foot's like this, when I get hit here, it can only take about 16 pounds per square inch before something's gonna start to go. The meniscus, the bone itself, those things. When I have it this way, and it's at a 90 degrees, you can take up to 9,000 pounds per square inch on that. So understanding little things like that give you a major advantage when you're dealing with uh, somebody attacking you. Right? Chances are the uh, attacker has not done 42 years of study on this stuff. <laughs> right? So I'm pretty sure. Um, now, so I'm going to look at um, can openers, things that I can do when this person overpowers me. So let's say um, we go into a control technique, headlock. Do, do you guys know what that is? From the neck. It's this way around the neck, yeah. Can I use you? Sure. Will you do partner with me? Sure. Put that down. Yeah. So usually if um, we're in here and I'm trying to control you, I'm going to move to one side or the other or I'm going to turn you around so I get all your weapons away from me. And that's just like common. It happens 86% of the time somebody fights and you get in this area, right? So I can switch it up. I can get out of here by doing a whole bunch of stuff that I know because I've done them a million times, but you don't. So when they're on you like that, and he's up here, he's gonna shoot one way or the other. So if I got him this way, I might shoot this way. So I pull him into a headlock. When a person grabs you that way, they're trying to control you as well. But if it does happen, a can opener that I like to use so that I don't have to do anything else, because maybe my position's precarious. Maybe I don't know where the brick wall is. I don't want my head to hit it. Right? Whatever is happening in that chaotic moment, once I'm down there and inside here, I use a couple of different can openers. The first one, well, first I gotta make sure that he's not choking me. So I gotta get my chin in. But I'm going to hold this and this side here. And the reason why I want to do that is if he disengages to punch me, I want to feel it. So I'm going to try this. I'm going to hold it, right? And once I'm here, okay, try to punch me. Okay, no, you can't, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so watch now. Here's, here's the thing. Like, I can't really do a whole lot right here, right? But I can go like this. I can pop inside here. I can pinch over here, I can pull this, I can prey on his instincts, fight, <laughs> right? And if I move in like that, his whole body moved off from me there. This one, I went, <laughs> right? Because your brain knows that sound. That's something wild, that's scary, that's bad. And even somebody holding you in power positions, you do that, bark, yell, bite, they're gonna, that they'll start. 
And that's all we need is a starter to get out, right? Now, for the guys, you're stuck here. Here's what I teach. Again. <laughs> Why? Why do you think it looks similar, though? Because because all the blood's gone from here, and I'm working on concepts. Get my hands in the face, interrupt the base. That's all I'm doing. Every time. Hand in the face, interrupt the base. Right? That's how I'm going to get away. So, um, there's a girl. She's uh, 15 years old now. And last year, she took my course at Cardinal Carter High School. And I do a five-day course with them. You guys get like an introductory two hours kind of thing, right? But I do five days with them, and we go over the exact same talk we had here. Um, I go over relationships. I don't talk about um, boys pressuring girls, or I talk about relationships because I don't care what your orientation is. It's the same violence, right? And it's really important to understand that that violence, even though we're scared of it and we don't, it has so many masks. Really, it's all one thing. And if we find the commonalities between it, it's easy to, to counter and fight, right? It's never easy, I can't say that. However, you're gonna have a much better chance than most, right? And it's important. This girl um, took my course in September last year, and um, I talked about the adrenal stress portion of the course, and uh, one thing I've been trying to spit out about three times tonight is that martial arts, fighting, and self-defense are three different animals, right? So this girl does martial arts as well, um, and she took my self-defense course. She got off work at Tim Hortons the following April, 7.30 at night, and she decided, like most seven teenagers do, she's going to take the shortcuts and walk through behind the garages to get up to her street. And uh, as she's walking along, she got hit on the head, and she has no idea where the guy came from. She didn't even see his face. But um, she fell down, he rolled her over, ripped her shirt off, and it's cold outside, right? It's April. Um, she scratched her back all up. He banged her head off the ground twice. and. The reason why I heard the story was I was teaching the second semester in May and she came back into the grade nine class and she said, girls, I really want you to listen up to this because this saved my life. And what she did was, as it was happening, she said, I, I, I thought I'm, it's over, I'm dead. Like, I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't know what to do. This is like, it was an overwhelming assault. She felt like just cringing up and dying. And as the guy smacked her head off the ground the second time, she said she saw his head go into focus, no focus, and then she remembered me saying, get your hands in the face. And she shot her hands straight up like that. And that was, she said it was literally like the heavens opening up before her. It was unbelievable. She could breathe. She could see again. She grabbed his head. She cranked it over. He fell off. She got off. She ran around the corner into the subway and there she was, bleeding, cut on the back of the head, shirt torn like a banana, half naked, to a 14-year-old girl. And the way that she said it was, but I saved myself. But, oh man, I bawled like a baby. It was like such a good story. And the girl's a, a wisp, she's so small. But she did, she, and it's that one concept that worked for her. Once you do that, everything else starts to open up and if you practice these things, um, these little things that we talked about are really important. Your awareness is the key. Anytime somebody's physically come in front of you, you've already done everything wrong, right? So it's really important to make sure that you're paying attention and stuff. But if it does happen to you, you really need to make sure that you're going to get out of that situation and remember the concepts. What I used to do, um, what I do with my students now is I'll say, Wednesdays, you six are going to the same school, right? Wednesdays from 12 to 12.15, you guys go ask your gym teacher for the gym and review your self-defense. 15 minutes, once a month. That's all it needs, right? And your awareness is, it has to be there. Like there's, there's so many things that uh, I could branch off and get into, like when you're traveling, 
right? You're going to Rome, and you know, you're walking down the street, and the subway's coming, whatever. You're walking, and you see all these kids sitting there, and they got these awesome signs and reminding you of them. Watch out for pickpockets, you know, like hold on to your valuables, and all these types of things, right? There's thieves about. And every time you walk by one of those signs, you subconsciously go, Oh, I got my passport, oh, my chain's still here, right? And there's six spotters who are those kids' parents over here watching you. And then all of a sudden, one guy comes up, oh, oh sorry, and the next guy's on this side, and your wallet's gone, and they'll go right inside your shirt. They're awesome at these things. Not with me. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, understanding those things, what kind of crime is where I'm going, you know? So I'm going away to school somewhere. I'm going to Dalhousie University. I want to know what that campus is. I want to know what the surrounding area around that campus is. I want to know what the crime stats are. Right? And it's, everything's at your fingertips nowadays. You know, the world, believe it or not, is the safest that it's ever been. We just hear about a lot more of the crap that goes on. Right? So at least there's that. We have at least some kind of a little shining light out there. And for me, it's, these are all very real um, things. I, I've dealt with criminals and um, abuse my entire life, right? Ever since I was a little boy. So it's, it's normal for me to have come around to this and I really, really enjoy um, giving people this knowledge, right? It's really important and it can save lives. I've had like at least five come back, five out of almost 5,000 that come back and say, this saved me, and it works, right? So if you remember the concepts, hands in the face, pie, don't slap, right? Really important. If you want to interrupt the person as much as you possibly can uh, by getting your hands in the face or striking that face until you can get away. Now, um, hair pulls, well, how much time do we have left? You have 20, minutes, 20 minutes, right? Good, okay. So hair pulls and um, escapes are important to practice, right? So if, even if I'm just getting out of a, a wrist grab and I'm hitting out, I want to look where I'm going and I don't want to cross my feet. I want to maintain my distance and get out this way. It's super important that you look where you're going. I've watched um, lots of people hurt themselves trying to escape a situation and end up in a worse one, right? So. You have to look where you're going. Make sure you don't trip over anything. Make sure you're getting a safe distance away from that person. What is a safe distance? How far would you say it's safe? Three feet. Three feet safe for physical contact. But if that person just attacked me, I want to get as far away as possible. What would be the safest distance where I could turn and start running? Very in public. Nine meters, 27 feet. 27 feet. The reason why they say 27 feet is under adrenal stress. Even if I'm down here and you've just dummied me and I'm the attacker, my adrenal shoot is going to go crazy right now because, oh shit, she see me, I'm hurt, I'm going to get caught, I got to get them. And I've watched guys literally jump from here, like three feet that way and come up on their feet and cover that distance like that. And they say 27 feet, it, and it's a tactical uh, advantage thing, because it takes a police officer about that 27 feet to draw his gun. And you would be right on top of him. Right, so somebody with a knife, same thing, 27 feet, they'll be on you in two, two and a half seconds. Right, so it's not that big of a distance. But when you start running full load, two and a half second head starts pretty good. So that's when I say it's safe enough to turn and run, right? But I wouldn't do it before then. I'd be across the back like this, but well, maybe from here to this, yeah. I'd probably turn and run at that distance, but you know, you really need to make sure that you're watching where you're going so you don't trip again. Um, if a person's, if you've overcome your attack, they're gonna be incredulous, scared, and just as adrenalized as you are, right? So you, you need to deal with that as well, which is a pretty scary situation to be in. You might end up um, <clears throat> fighting again, 
if you don't do it right the first time. Right? Or you miss, or something happens, they're going to grab a hold of you, and then something else will come to you. Oh yeah, Darren said pinch the ribs. Right? If somebody's got a hold of your body here, grabbing one side and twisting the opposite way on both sides, here, makes them come up. Right? It's a natural instinctive reaction. Ah! That's what happens. And it's also sending a cross signal to the brain, so I'm confusing that instinctual reaction. Right? By going opposite way on both sides. I can't go the same way. It doesn't work the same. I have to go opposite, and it works every time. And that's kind of neat. Those are like the can opener things that I was talking about, right? They're really good for you. Now, if you're worried about um, repercussions, hitting somebody in the eyes and stuff, or scraping across the eyeballs, keep in mind that the human body is wondrous, and I can take my finger right up to there in my eye, and it's totally fine. Do it. <laughs> right? Like, I'm seeing sparks and stuff, but even the other side, right? I can stick it right in there, but it does, I'm not hurt, right? So neither is he. And if he's done this before, he's probably had this, right? So you're really going to have to do something about that because they know that this is, I can deal with this, right? I can't deal with it if you go any further. You go one millimeter further, that's when you start ripping retina and stuff, and you, you can actually poke right in and it'll explode. You can't poke the eyeball out of the socket. It doesn't work, it'll explode, right? So even hitting him in the face, I'm not worried about it because I know that the human body can take that, right? If I'm being absolutely rude and mean and I dig in and pull out, I, my life has to be in major danger for that to happen, but I have that option. And I think of that option. Even though I'm a nice guy and I do things, Violence begets violence, right? I, I, I uh, posted a uh, meme on Facebook just recently, and uh, I was talking about, I was on the streetcar, and there was two guys uh, interacting, and they were cutting up, and they're pushing each other, and yelling and screaming. One of them had bought something, and it was obviously really important to them. They didn't have any money for whatever else they needed. And it was a huge altercation for everybody on the bus and I was watching people cower away from them and they were getting scared and I just I leaned in and I went guys come on and they both looked at me and I said like just look around people are really concerned man take it outside and they looked at me and the one went to say something and the other one was looking at me and he went like don't do that and the meme that I posted was you know, you can call yourself peaceful if you want to. You, you can call yourself peaceful. But the only way you can really be peaceful is if you're capable of real violence. Right? I'm peaceful because I choose not to be violent. You're peaceful because you can't. You don't know how. Right? I've studied this stuff so that I can take those violent people and being peaceful, I can still uh, control them that way. Right? So, if you're, how's it, how's it go? If, if I'm going to be peaceful, it means I need to be capable of violence. If I'm saying I'm peaceful and I'm not capable of violence, then I'm harmless. Right? And if I'm harmless, that's the guy he's going to go for. So, I need to think differently about the way I move around. Right? We live in a city with 3.9 million people. That's a lot. Right? You can't know everybody. You can't know every area. You're always going to be forced into a situation when you're day-to-day -day situation where you're in a spot that's not the same. And you're going to have to be able to deal with that. And your awareness is the key. Right? Where are we? Okay. Put a hair pulse. So if, um, if you've got a manipulation, somebody's grabbing, that's secondary location grab, right? If they grab your hair, Mine. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> so when they grab your hair, it doesn't matter if it's the side, the back, the other side, the front, whichever part of the hair you, they grab, you want to turn around to face them just like I showed you initially. And here. Right? So if he grabs that hair that way, I'm still going to turn with it, and i got to get my feet underneath my shoulders this way. 
I don't want to turn and walk on a tightrope like this, because now he's just going to pull me. When somebody's got a hold of my head, where the head goes, the body has to follow. So it's very dangerous for me. So I want to get my hands, this is flexible, it moves. Right? If you get a little bit of a pull, it's not that big of a deal. Grab your hair on one side, just here, and just give it a tug. It feels okay, right? I want you to reach across to the other side of your head now, do it at the same tug. Big difference, eh? Yeah, because the follicles don't work that way and it engages the nerve centers. So when they're grabbing a hold of you, sometimes it's blinding pain too, right? <laughs> they reach your head like that and, and you'll see sparks, literally. So I want to turn when he grabs, but then I'm going to turn and go this way and I'm going to plead. I'm going to play on, on those things. Please stop, 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 help, help. I, I, listen, listen, I, I'm doing what you want. What do you need? What do you need? Right? And the second that I feel them let go, or they start to relax, they're preying on that need to control. Oh, shit, I'm finally getting this under control. Now they're going to cover your mouth or whatever. That little second where they pause is where we go right into that full of assault. Boom, 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 into the face until I can get backed up and out of the way. Some of the other can openers that are available when you end up in a position like this, and I shoot up, so I'm gonna shoot up. I can go this way into the legs. I wanna kick on the inside or the inside here, but I don't wanna take my feet off the ground. Okay, so I'm shifting this way, like bang. And if I hit you there, uh, it might sweep you, but there's a nerve center in here that makes you do this. And that's what happens, right? So I want to separate that quadricep right there with my knee. And it doesn't take much. It's a full solid spot there. And every time you hit it, the body does one of those. And it works to help you get away. Make sense? Yeah. So hair pulls, we're just going to practice them in, from back, side, side, and front. Front's the easiest because you just got to get your hands up. Right? If they're from the back, I want you to get your feet under your shoulders. Right? I don't want my feet to be on the same line. I need a base here, and then my hands will go to the face, and I'm going to the same thing. Right? Does that make sense? Going straight in here. Give it a try. You don't need pads for this. <laughs> When he grabs on, I really don't think it's just So you want to make sure that you get underneath the You guys can't really go full out doing this. Um, one of our instructors that works with us at SAFE, her name is Pamela Armitage. She's an amazing woman. Um, she teaches this self defense stuff. She's about 108 pounds, right? Um, but she uh, is so um, dedicated to this that I remember Saturday we tossed her about at least 700 times that day by the hair. 
to, to figure out what works and what doesn't work, right? When we show you these things, it's not theory. I've lived it, we've worked it, we've done it. We've punched the crap out of each other doing it. We've used rubber knives to the point where you got welt marks on you, right? Like when we use knives stuff, it's like, it's not, not like you see in, in the self-defense classes and stuff. It's not like that. Real life isn't like that. And those self-defense classes taught by martial artists, there's no adrenal stress. It doesn't work. And I'm a martial artist saying that, okay? I've, I've lived my life through this stuff. I know what works and what doesn't work. This works because it's the concepts that make it work. My body moves in circles. So if I need to cut off a circle, I go through the middle. It works every time, right? It's, it's just the way it is. It works. Now, if I'm thinking about um, the adrenal stress hitting my body, I already know that my fine motor skills are gone. All I have is these gross motor things. I don't even think of like trying to grab or do any of these things anymore. I just know that this is what I got. That's what I got to work with right now. So that's what I use. Most of all, I hone my desire to get home safe. Right? And no matter where I go, I'm always looking for opportunities to learn a little bit more about my self-defense. Well, that's pretty peculiar. There's three pickaxes there, six workers over there, and four homeless guys right there. I pick that stuff up, right? I pick it up really quick, and I make sure that I identify stuff like that in my environment so that I can get home to my wife and kid every day. Right? It's super, super, obviously that's what's important to me, but you need your own reason. You need it to be important to you. And the other thing that um, I always like to end with is talk about this stuff with people, right? There's so many misconceptions and fallacies about what this stuff is. Like, fighting is fighting. Um, if I can compare martial arts fighting and self-defense, it's like badminton, ping pong, and tennis. And every one of them, I'm hitting something over a net with some kind of a racket, but they're all different sports, right? Self-defense is real life. Martial arts is art. Fighting is consensual. What's happening to you is not. That's what makes it self-defense. Right? So whatever you do, I hope that you always want to get home safe. But talk to your children about this. Talk to people in, in the right um, age groups. Or, you know, like if you're at work and you see somebody that's uh, not paying attention, their purse is half open as they're leaving. It's like, hey, close your purse. Right? Just close it. It's so much easier than somebody looking at it going, oh, right? You're inviting things that way. Little things like that make a big difference. Ladies, if you're carrying purses, you know, um, cross strap is best for pickpockets, but you're stuck if somebody's pulling on it. Right? Pulling it on your shoulder is always best. It's easy release if they tried to steal it. If you got it across here, they're going to pull on it or they'll cut it possibly. Right, but you're gonna have a better opportunity to get away if it's over here. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. And I always want my purse to the inside. I don't want it on the outside if I'm in general public. If I'm in the uh, Eaton Center and here's the walkway and here's the food court, I want my purse in between my legs. I don't want it on either side. There's <laughs> lots of traffic both ways, right? Like you, you can protect your stuff. That's part of your self-defense. The way you go about your day um, says what's going to happen to you, basically speaking, right? If I'm used to dropping my, my purse here and my coat over here and I'm out in public somewhere and somebody decides to pick that up, my loss because I didn't protect my own stuff, right? That's the way I look at it. It's, it's pretty uh, simple when it comes down to it. At the end of the day, it's really common sense. Pay attention to what's happening around you. Acknowledge everything coming towards you. When you find yourself daydreaming and often, oh, what happens if when I go into this meeting or, oh my gosh, I can't believe that just happened over there when we did that, you're missing everything in between. And when you're missing everything in between, that's a really good opportunity. And that's usually when shit hits a fan for you in one way or another, right?
You might find that you just tripped on the sidewalk. Well, if you would have been paying attention, you would have saw that. Right? There's little things like that that make the big difference. But for me, um, since I really started like embracing this and doing this about three years ago, I had to have my hip replaced, so I retired from security. Um, and uh, PTSD, I really needed to, to spend some time going through some counseling and figuring out what was going on, because I didn't understand it at that point. And that's why I'm such an advocate when I talk about these things, right? It's okay to have trauma, and it's okay to know about it. It never goes away, but I can talk about it, and I can still be a regular individual. I don't have to go crazy about it or anything. If something happens to you, you need to get help, right? It's really, really simple. You have to. You're going to feel like you don't want to. But when I look at it, you're affecting everybody in your family if something happens to you. So the first thing you need to do is be aware. But the way you're affecting everybody in your family is they worry about you. And what are we all about? Family strong, right? So everybody, every member of the family is out here doing their jobs. Something happens to you and they all turn and look at you. And when they all turn and look at you, you feel shame. Go out, do your jobs. I'll be okay. But you're not okay. You need their support right then. So you feel more shame because the family's there for you. And they're not actually making the family strong anymore. They're focusing on you. Right? So it's just a huge spiral if you don't get any help. You just feel worse and worse and worse. And talking about it is key. Right? Getting it out in the open. And talking to your people about the potential of something happening and how easy it is to take care of yourself just by walking four feet out from that wall, you know, so that I can see the angles and have somewhere to go, uh, making sure I'm not going through a dark park by myself at night time. I know that Queen and Sherbourne area is bad after 9 o'clock. I'm not going to walk through there, right? There's really simple things that we can do every day to keep yourself safe, and we ignore them. Day in, day out. And it's just ridiculous, right? Because every time you watch the news, if you watch a one hour segment of news, almost five out of seven days in a week, you'll see somebody going, I can't believe this, it happens to people on TV. Guess what? You're on TV now. Right? And that's, that's the way it works. We always think it happens to somebody else. If you just pay attention to it, you can easily avoid it. So that's I'm gonna leave you guys with that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any questions or anything? Nada nada? Nada? Okay. Good stuff. Um, that was fun for me. I hope it was fun for you. I, uh, I felt a little bit choppy at the beginning, and I think I was paying attention to that thing. <laughs> I, just, I just tried to let it go, and then I kind of got back in my natural rhythm.